Okay, we're looking at Romans 11, a difficult chapter in the Bible for the church, the body of Christ. It's luminous. It initially talks about Israel and the remnant that were saved out of the unbelieving nation who fell to the unpardonable sin in Matthew chapter 12. They rejected the testimony of the Holy Spirit and those that believed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the book of Acts. And the illustration is Pharaoh, and often rebuke hardeneth the heart. And we have Israel hardened against the Lord. So they were blinded for a season. But some believed. And those that believed will have to wait for their kingdom in ages to come. Uh, the Apostle Paul gives an, an outline of the book of Acts in verse 11 where he says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? That word stumbled, the verb, helps you understand the second strike against Israel, which was to trip over what? Christ. A stone of stumbling, it says in Romans chapter 9, right in this section of Bible orientation. What's going on today is the question. And the church, if you ask the church what's going on today, what, what are they going to tell you? Same thing the leaders of Israel told the eunuch in, in Acts chapter 8. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but we go with this. Why? Well, because we make celebrities out of theologians in the church, the body of Christ. We make celebrities out of them. And I'll tell you what, it, I'm to the point now where I listen to the celebrity of man. We did a message on this one time. And it makes me angry. You know Why? I don't want to talk about the celebrity of man. I want to talk about the celebrity of Christ. You notice how all these celebrities, if the magnifying glass goes on them, what happens to them pretty soon? Especially the superstars. What happens to them? They hit the bottom. And you know what? The celebrities in the Bible are the same way. Abraham, Moses, they have this moment of exaltation and then they hit the bottom. What does that demonstrate? They're not the celebrity. The Lord is. Okay? And so, unlike Israel, who murdered the Lord in unbelief, like the Gentiles, who worshipped bugs over the Lord in the first 2,000 years of human history, chose to worship bugs, and they put the creation over the what? the Creator. And it's a lie, all these idols and the celebrity of man. The celebrity of man in believers, it, it, it should cause revulsion. Our celebrity is the Lord and none other is worthy. Paul magnifies his office. He takes the whole Bible and he magnifies his apostleship. Are there other apostleships in the Bible? And are there other luminous figures? Moses is called the mediator between God and man in time past. Paul takes the magnifying glass and why does he take a magnifying glass and put it on his office? Because that's what's going on today. The rise of the Gentiles. And Paul is what? The agency from the preaching of our message to him to all men. So Paul puts a magnifying glass on his office. Not because who he is. He's not the celebrity. And how many times does he say that in the Bible, right? He's not worthy. I'm not worthy. <laughs> Notice, he goes on and he explains the casting away of Israel. Okay? And then he goes into the illustration of not the trees of Israel, but a tree of Israel. And that tree is the olive tree. And notice in 16 he says, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. What's the root? What's the lump? It, it, it would be Jews that come from the root, which are unleavened. There's no sin in them. That lump. You know, you know, when you make, we were watching Chef Ramsay and he was making um, uh, pasta and he was showing how to make it from scratch. And uh, it's just a big lump of what? Flour, oil, and egg. 
and he sets it over here. Well, this is the lump right here, and it's leavened. Okay, there is no sin in it. Why? Well, for those that believe, they believe like the root, and who's the root of the nation? No. Abraham. Abraham, who believed without works and was justified, you remember, in the message that God gave him. Okay? And remember, the word Abraham means what? Abram means Chaldean. Okay? Whose name became, when God spoke to him, he crossed over the flood and his name, his name, moniker became Hebrew. Okay? But Abraham believed God before the law and before circumcision. Abraham's the root of the lump of all those generations of Jews that believed. Because only believing, not the works of the law, will justify you. So he goes into the illustration of one tree. What are the four trees of Israel? That's this one. Vine, fig, bramble. What's the fig? That's Luke 13, where the Lord comes to take care of the, of the, um, the, the uh, field, and he's looking for figs on the fig tree, and he finds none. There was no fruit from the fig tree, which is the national life okay, of Israel. The national life of Israel. He finds no figs. And what does he petition the Lord? The one that sent the husbandman, which is Christ. What, is he, what does he petition the Lord? Leave it alone for one year. Okay? And dung it. Holy Spirit. And dung it. And see if there's any what? Fruit. And that's the explanation of his what? Of what? Acts 1 through 7, where... Like Isaiah 8 says, they received the testimony of the children, the disciples, the little flock. Okay? And what did they do? Like Pharaoh, one, two, three, you're out. Pharaoh was even more, wasn't he? You know, Pharaoh got to get, what do they call that in golf when you miss the first shot? A mulligan. Pharaoh got lots of mulligans. But Israel got three strikes. And when they rejected the testimony of the Holy Spirit and the little flock, God set them aside according to prophecy. And I mean according to prophecy. He set them aside. Okay. And he brings up the olive tree because the olive tree is the spiritual life of Israel. Real life. That would mean you'd have to have whom? The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And in Israel... Right? who were in Christ before me, in order to be in Christ, what do you have to do? You have to believe in that blood and you have to what? Uh, and then receive God the Holy Spirit, which isn't up to you. Okay? In you. That olive tree is spiritual life. And so what happens? Well, God breaks off what? The natural branches and he does what? He grafts us into the tree, right? And we feed then, therefore, off of the root. What do we have in common with Israel? Same Savior. Same Holy Spirit. Correct? Same Holy Spirit. Well, not the same faith as a body of truth, but faith is required in what's been given to the world. In this case, we see a transfer from a fall and a transfer of the spiritual life of the olive tree to the church, the body of Christ, who are grafted into the root with the natural branches being broken off. Okay, so that's where I kind of want to pick it up here. Notice Romans 11.25. We've studied this before, and this is very critical. There's seven, I would not have you be ignorant, phrases in Paul's epistles. There's seven of them. This is the second one, 
Meaning that, turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I want you to notice this. This is critical. Romans 1, 9. For God is my witness whom I, and I want you to notice this phrase right here, serve with my spirit. Ephesians 4 tells us that, that the spirit is what? Our mind. The spirit of our mind. Romans 12 says that we need to be what? Transformed by the renewing of our mind. So here's my point. I serve God with my spirit. Where do you serve God from? Practically your heart. But your heart has to, has to select from where? From your spirit, what you know. And Paul says in Romans 1, 9, because he wants to establish these saints in Rome, he says you serve with your spirit like I do. So you cannot be ignorant of these seven things. You can't and function and serve God. I don't know who you're serving, but you're not serving God if you don't know these seven things. So you have to determine to know these seven things. The first one is our gospel in Romans 1. You notice where it says that in 13? Romans 1, 13. And I just want to focus really on one here a little bit today. But notice verse 13. Now, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren. What's ignorant mean? Stupid, ain't bad. Unlearned, unintelligized, unable. It's not even possible to serve the Lord. Well, I serve the Lord in my own heart. You know, I like nature. I, you know, all that nonsense you hear. Well, the Word of God is first, isn't it? Well, no, the newspaper's first. Not anymore, right? My smartphone's first, right? And all that crap that comes down the line from the adversary in the kingdom of darkness. And I mean a pile of crap. Nothing like unfiltered crap coming directly to you and sucking it all down. You can argue with me all you want. You'd be wrong. It's, what are we, we're inventors of what? Romans 1? Evil things. You say, well, you can use it for good. Yeah, that's what we do as sinners. We tend to do and believe the good side of the tree. Remember, there's the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. What's man's good to God? Your righteousness is as a filthy rag, the Lord says in Isaiah 53. It's just a fact. It's just a fact. And we pour that stuff, you know, we pour that stuff down like syrup on pancakes. I mean, Something else, you know. And people don't give any attention to the Word of God. And you can't serve God unless you intelligize your spirit. And you can't intelligize your spirit if you get together and, and, and enjoy the ministry of believers that serve with their spirit intelligized by these seven things. And the first is our gospel. Romans 1, 2, 3 is our gospel. Romans 1, 2, 3. Notice he goes on to say here, oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, was let hitherto prevented, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. He's saying, I got an all-man message. He's introducing a new agency of blessing, the church, the body of Christ. So as much as I is in, as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Do you see that? And what's the gospel of Christ? Romans 1.18 to Romans 3.20 is the problem. Is the problem. And what's the problem? Sin. In verse 9 he says, What then? Are we better than they? No, and no wise for Jews. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Romans 1, 18 through 3, 20 is a courtroom setting. Remember that message we did? It's a courtroom setting. Whose court? God's court. Whose justice? God's justice. 
Loretta Lynn, DOJ, Chief what? Law Enforcement Officer. Are you kidding me? Are you going to juxtaposition that with the courtroom of God, our Savior? Romans 1.18 through 3.20 is the problem, and it's sin. And that makes us subject to the wrath of God revealed from heaven above on sin. Romans 3.22 to 26, that's the provision. And you see all those subassemblies of the cross. The righteousness of God, the faith of Jesus Christ, the redemption in Christ Jesus, the propitiation, the satisfaction of God the Father in that payment for sin, and the remission of sins. Remission, forgiveness of sins, the payment for sins. Forgiveness is based on payment with God's justice in His court. It's not awarded because you got enough money, right? You got the most money. It's not awarded because of the fervor of your petition. It's not awarded because of who you are. So we have those subassemblies of the cross. That's the provision that God provided to those all proved under sin in His court. And then Romans 3.26 is our responsibility. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be the just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. See that? That's the responsibility. Belief in the provision. That's the gospel that Paul says you need to be intelligized with that took me forever to learn when I was a new Christian. All I needed to do was not be ignorant of Romans 1, 2, and 3. It took me forever to gain Romans 1, 2, and 3. Okay? Now, the second I would not have you be ignorant, the first is Paul's gospel. The second is Romans 11, verse... 25. 24 says, For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, that'd be the Gentiles, wild trees, and wert graft contrary to nature, nature didn't produce this as God initially created it. He did something unique. He says, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their olive tree again? They're cut off, but he says, that doesn't mean I'm not going to put them back in. But we were grafted, wild olive trees, into Israel's olive tree to get to Abraham, to be justified by faith alone without works. Verse 25, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant. What can't you be ignorant of? This is the second one. To serve God in your spirit, you can't do that without knowing number two, which is you should be ignorant of this mystery. It's a mystery. It was hidden until the Apostle Paul. It was kept secret uh, by God. It was purposed before the world began in eternity past by the Godhead. It was a council of the Godhead. They purposed this. And then what happened? One of the proofs that the Lord Jesus Christ divested Himself in His spirit, His mind, is that He says He doesn't know when the Father is going to do what? Restore the kingdom on earth. How could that be? if He purposed with God the Father, not only before the world began, but since the world began, both prophetic and mystery purpose. Have a host in the heavens first, and then a host in the... Think about that. Above is restored first before below on the earth. Okay? And you can't be ignorant of what comes first. And that's God's purpose in the heavenly places. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. See that word blindness right there? Do 
Jews, and there are none before God. But since their fall in Acts chapter 7, judicially they fell there. Since then, they've been blind. They couldn't see the Lord if they wanted to see the Lord. Why? It's like our dog. I watched him yesterday. He was outside and they were playing bagos. And you know how the board for bagos tilts up? And there's this end right here. I watched him walk right into the end. Bam! With his head on the move. And you just think, oh, you know, blind. Can't see. You bump into him, you don't know what you bumped into. Israel's blind. There is no Israel. There is no Israel. There is no Savior for Israel. And what's God doing today? Well, he, he broke them off, the olive tree, and he grafted us on. Wild, right? Idol worshipers. He grafted them on, and they get sustenance from the root, believing. And he says that you can't be ignorant of that. Okay, Now, we're going to look at that blindness for a second because some people say that blindness is something else. But I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. Don't think this wasn't prophesied concerning Israel. Not concerning us and not concerning the mystery. That was still secret. It's easy for us and what the church at large and the church the body of Christ does is from a vantage point of progressive relation, uh, progressive revelation fulfilled, that is a back cover on your Bible, they make all kinds of suppositions about what the Jews knew in time past. And it's just not true. You remember the twelve? Who were they taught by for three years? Messiah, the Christ, who divested himself, right? So that means he had to be instructed again by who? As a baby, he didn't know everything. And sitting there with those eyes, you know, Hollywood likes to take and put maturity into a babe, right? Or genius that, that hey, I remembered when I was born. That's how intelligent I am, you know. Uh, that that was born. <sighs> that that was born. Oh, what am I saying now? I completely lost my train of thought. Um, he divested himself, and as a baby, he then was what? Revested, as it were, by what? God the Father. Constant communication with God the Father. At 13, what's he doing? He's teaching at the temple. And you'll hear him say something like, I don't know. How could he say, I don't know, if he is who he is? There's a big controversy about that in, in the grace movement. Big controversy. Blah, 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 blah. You know, here's the thing. Philippians 2 tells you what he did. He divested himself and became as a man. And then what did he do? He's constant communication with the Father. <laughs> right? And he does what? In the spirit of his mind. Does that mean he's not who he is in his soul? Yeah, he's who he is. But he he. He did what he did, right? And the father did what? Put it back, as it were. Put it back. Um, my point is, he didn't know about he he didn't know about the mystery and when the kingdom would come. Because in that question, when shalt thou restore the kingdom? In Acts chapter one, that the disciples ask, and what does he say? The father knows. You say, well, he's just saying the Father knew. No, there's another place in the Scriptures. I'm not going to go there. For, I don't, I'm not doing that today. But there's another place where he says, I don't know. Why? Because the Father didn't even reveal the mystery to God the Son, who was not yet God the Son declared to be like he was. It's amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. Imagine submitting to that. Yeah. Acts chapter 8, stay there, and I'll just read this one. Look at John chapter 17. Verse 3 says, And this is the life eternal, 
<clears throat> that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom Thou hast sent. So God the Father sends the Lord Jesus Christ. And He divests Himself, Philippians chapter 2, among other places. And then God the Father intelligizes His Spirit with who He is. You for, you, it, would, it would be as if you said, you forgot who you were. And He revests the Lord Jesus Christ, intelligizes Him. Notice it says here, and this is, this is life eternal, verse 3, John 17, that they might know Thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom Thou hast sent. I have glorified Thee on the earth. I have finished the work which Thou gavest Me to do. And now, O Father, glorify Thou Me with Thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Has he received that glory yet? Not in John chapter 17. And that literally has to do with the resurrection from the dead. Okay. So, go back to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8 doesn't discuss the mystery. Isaiah chapter 8 discusses Matthew through Acts 7. Prophetically. Notice in verse 14, Isaiah 8. And he shall be for a, that's, that's Messiah, whom he sent, the Father, for a sanctuary. What's the sanctuary you need? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's your sanctuary. That's where you worship. That's whom you worship. You need to be in him. He says, but for a stone of stumbling. Wow. We read that not only in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but we read that in Paul's epistles in Romans chapter 9. For a rock of offense. He was offensive to the Jews, was he not? He offended those religious pundits. So I look at anchors on TV, you know. These political pundits. And he says... For a, and they're all come lately, you know. I don't know what's going on. And he says, for a rock of... And they love to prognosticate like the Lord, don't they? What do you do? Well, the anchors, they get so-called experts, and the experts prognosticate on the future. And they're mostly what? And if they're right, it's an accident. Because you know what? You know what? They don't know. They don't know. They don't know anything. Because somebody that professes themselves to be wise has, be, has become what? A fool. They don't know. But for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both houses of Israel, northern kingdom, southern kingdom, right? Ten tribes, two tribes. And then he says, for a jinn. What's a jinn? That's a trap. Walk right into a trap. Blind. See, he's referring to their blindness and unbelief. And they walk right into a trap. Do, 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 do. And they walk right into it, right? And then a snare. What happens when you try to get out of the trap? You're stuck. You can't get out. Israel couldn't get out because of unbelief. It's a snare. To the inhabitants of Jerusalem, even in Jerusalem, that's Judah. And many among them shall stumble and fall. That's Romans 11.11, 11, the outline of Acts. Not only do they stumble on that rock of offense, that stumbling stone, but then they fall. They reject God the Holy Spirit. You see what that's... Isn't that what we're talking about? At Isaiah 8 describes the fall of the former agency of blessing. It does not discuss the agency that what? Replaces them. Paul does. Christ does to Paul and Paul to us. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. And be taken. I mean, they're going to be ripped out of the earth and go down to where? Hellfire. Bind up the testimony. This is Acts, beginning of Acts. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among the disciples. What did Christ do in, in Acts chapter 1? He sent what? 
Remember, they didn't really understand all that he taught them until they received God the Holy Spirit in John chapter 20, not Acts chapter 2. He breathed the breath of life on them, the Holy Spirit. And they, all that he taught came to what? Their remembrance, and they understood it. When he says, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, what's he saying? Who's the one testifying to Messiah risen from the dead? Who's testifying to that? The little flock in Acts chapter 1 to 7. The testimonies in them. Acts chapter 8 prophetically describes Matthew through Acts chapter 7. The children there, the little flock. Okay? Go back to Romans 11 11. Romans 11 11. We'll wind this down. Romans 11, 11. We already said through, the, through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles and the nations. Remember John 4, 22, salvation is of the Jews. Politically they'd fallen, but salvation was still of the Jews. Okay? In Romans 11.11, 11, never forget this, an outline of Acts. They stumbled at that stone, Christ. And you know, you just back that up. His petition in the parable in Luke chapter 13, where he says what? Don't chop down the fig tree, the religious life of Israel. It should have produced faith in Messiah. He says, dung it up for a year. And well, if it doesn't produce any figs, then chop it down. And that's what happens in Acts chapter 7. Israel as an agency of blessing is as a spiritual agency of salvation is no longer. They are chopped down. And then what is, what's one of the seven things Christ says on the cross? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Okay. Matthew 12, what won't be forgiven them? Rejecting the testimony bound up in those children. That's the testimony of God the Holy Spirit in Acts 1 to 7. So then, in Romans 11:32, here's the difference between Romans 11 and Isaiah 8. There's no mystery in Isaiah chapter 8. Paul is introducing Bible orientation, what God is doing today. And the, and the topic is the rise of the Gentiles and their new apostle, the Apostle Paul, who preaches the mystery, which is the second thing in your Bible you can't be ignorant of. Romans 1, 9, I serve God with my spirit. You cannot serve the Lord ignorant, unintelligized, stupid about what God's doing today. Like Israel, blind. 32, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Okay, that agency is gone, first generation, Jew and Gentile, and they diminish, right? They diminish as Messianic believers, and the program diminishes because it's replaced by what? The fulfilled word of God through the pen of the Apostle Paul. And Paul says these things are going on, but they'll fail, they'll cease, right? Knowledge, prophecy, knowledge, tongues, they'll, miracles, they'll fail. They'll cease. When what? When faith, love, and hope are established on the page through the pen of the Apostle Paul, the inspired Word of God. Look at Romans 16.25. Now to him that is of power to establish you. The S is gone, the prefix, because that's Paul's desire to establish them. And now we just got established, which means it's done in Romans. A book of faith in the cross work while on the earth. And he says, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Who's the first one to preach the mystery? God the Savior. Paul says he wasn't sent to baptize, but to do what? 
preach? Who established that example? The risen Lord Jesus Christ. When he taught, kind of like the Father, and there's some similarities, taught the Son (laughs) as he grew in stature, right? As he grew in wisdom. What, what did Paul, who was Paul in constant communication with? Who was, when he had Bible study, who did he have it with? The Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ preached and he listened. He says, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since before the world began. And I won't go there, but 1 Corinthians 2 says, Paul says, look, I, I told you about the mystery, you Corinthians. Right? The hidden wisdom of God. What's mystery mean? It's not the mystery parables of the kingdom in Matthew through John, right? The things concerning prophecy, the things concerning a kingdom on the earth. Okay. Which was kept secret since before the world began. It was never spoken until the risen Lord Jesus Christ came down from heaven's glory and preached it to the Apostle Paul. And mystery means hidden wisdom. Hidden. God kept a secret. Look at Romans 11.25. Romans 11.25. Romans 11.25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, the mystery is not Israel's forecasted fall and blindness. Is that the mystery? Well, it's a precursor to the mystery, right? It's a precursor. But the mystery is what? The rise of the Gentiles. The forming from all men an agency, a new agency of blessing. Now, here's where covenant theology gets all mixed up. They think they've been grafted in and that they're spiritual Israel. Israel spiritually fell. God didn't replace the agency. He says it right here. Verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them. There's that word covenant, covenant theology. When I shall take away their sins. Is the kingdom still going to come? How could we be spiritual Israel? That's why when you go to these evangelical churches and Baptist churches and, and, and Protestant churches, that's why when you go to them, they're preaching the four covenants. The Abrahamic covenant, the Moses covenant, right? The Davidic covenant and the new covenant. Why? They think they're spiritual Israel. When you do that, what do you do? You take your Bible like Peter says and you do what? Twist it into a, a mess. It's nothing but a mess when you do that. We are not spiritual Israel. They fell. We're a new agency. We're not a agency that revitalizes what the nation Israel wouldn't do. That's just arrogance anyhow. What makes the Gentiles better than the Jews? That's arrogance, isn't it? Both do what? Invest and capitalize with unbelief, right? It's just arrogance. Covenant theology is arrogance. It's repulsive to me. It's Baal worship to me. Henceforth, we know no man after the flesh. We don't even know who. When you make yourself spiritual Israel, you also adopt their works, right? And so you see all these works in the Protestant denominations, from the Protestant Reformation. Like what? Water baptism in varying degrees. I mean, we go through all of Israel's manifestation gifts that they think they're involved with still. And you know, the more conservative and the more wealthy Protestants, you know, they go, well, we don't believe in the miraculous stuff because we're educated. We, we believe in water baptism, though. What's water baptism? What is it in the Bible? What's it a sign of? The Davidic covenant. 
a nation of priests that are going to go out to all the nations of the earth in a kingdom on the earth. That's what water baptism is. Okay. What is the mystery? If Romans 25, the blindness of Israel is not the mystery. That's a precursor to it. They had to fall before there could be a new agency. And that's what Romans 9, 10, 11 in Bible orientation is explaining. There's nothing more important than this as we started out. It's repulsive to me to hear about the celebrity of man. Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps. I mean, the guy's got a kid. And he's not involved with the institution of marriage. He is in his heart, I suppose. But I'm not really picking on him. But, you know, he's one of these icons. And, and I look at that and I go, why would I want to follow that guy? Anything about him? He's no celebrity to me. My celebrity is the Lord Jesus Christ. None other is worth what? Believing. Celebrities. Celebrities in every area. We're a society of celebrities. Why do we celebrate celebrities in our culture? Because it's a culture now of unbelief. The Protestant Reformation in the United States is dead. The churches are preaching Baal worship as an object of faith for the church, the body of Christ. And people support it. Here's the mystery, and we'll quit here but in a couple, three passages. But look at Ephesians chapter 3. Here's the mystery. How could you miss this? I mean, really? Anybody in here just like genius level and able to see this? Well, yeah, me. Is that ridiculous? All, all I do is ass I'm an assembler. When I work for a company, I used to write, they call them routes. And it's complicated equipment, you know. It's computer driven before they're, you know, computer board driven. And I, you know, I, I used to write the routes on how to assemble them. Okay. For a while, I did that. And, you know, they were the first machines that the sewing machine, these complicated machine, this complicated industrial machinery could do a logo, you program. You program it, and you put in, they called it a prom. And you put it in, and it sewed whatever, right? And we had to build these things. And I had to write the routes for them. And all I was was what? An assembler. That's, all the pre that's, that's what Ecclesiastes, the master of assemblies. That's what Solomon was, the master of assemblies concerning human wisdom. Uh, 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 human wisdom literature. Just assemblers. How could you miss it? Unfaithfulness. They trust in the wisdom of man. They glorify man. They make celebrity of man. I'll sit there and look at believers that are entrenched in the celebrity of man. I, I, I've seen them all my life. And I just shake my head and I just think, and not one day you'll know better. I feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for him. I mean, in your heart on a daily basis, do you worship the celebrity of Christ? Well, most of my days, I worship the celebrity of man. In whatever your arena that you admire is. And, you know, one day, you can say, well, I'll do what I want, Chuck. Well, one day you won't. One day you won't. And I'm not going to laugh at you. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to praise him. He's not going to laugh at you either. Because you'll have a diminished capacity to do what everybody wants to do in the heavenly places. And that's make a celebrity out of him. Why? He's worth it. These others aren't worth it. You know, I was talking about Michael Phelps. Here's a guy that's, I guess, not going to get married probably till after the Olympics because that's foremost. And I can't, I don't want, I don't know why. I really don't know why, but I know he's married. He has a kid and a wife, but they didn't participate in the institution of marriage. Hey, maybe they did secretly. I don't know. But I'm just saying, if, is that a good picture for the youth of America? It's kind of, it's right up there with Clinton saying, character doesn't matter. 
Remember at, at Wheeling High School, the banner that was on the soffit up there? Character does matter. <laughs> I mean, there's even the public schools acknowledging how felonious that statement is. It's destructive to the youth of America. Remember Clinton defined sex. Remember that? Celebrities define the institution of marriage. It doesn't matter if you declare your union and then have the child. Remember what it says in the institution back there in Genesis? What? Cleave and leave or leave and cleave? Leave and cleave. So what's being eroded through a celebrity? The institution of marriage. And I watched the broadcasters flustered on how to describe it. <laughs> Older guys. They, they didn't know how to describe it. Now I'm not picking on one guy. We could pick on all of us, right? And who we, who we are in our own strength. And the ridiculousness of what we think. Especially about God's institutions which stabilize and, and perpetuate the human race. Successfully. Ephesians 3, 6, there's the mystery, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, I'll, I'll, read, I'll read it so it's identified, which it says in 4, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that, here it is, the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise. Titus chapter 1, verse 2, that promise is eternal life that God promised before the world began, it says in Titus 1-2. In Christ by the gospel, the first thing you can't be ignorant of. Second thing you can't be ignorant of is the mystery. You want to see a passage that defies covenant theology? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Speaking of celebrities, uh, Michael Jordan the dream team, the team that goes to the Olympics. And they're in the locker room. You know what Michael says to the, heir apparent, the, the, former, heir, the former celebrities? Uh, what's the guy in Boston? Larry Bird. Larry Bird. And what's the guy on the Lakers? Magic, Magic Johnson. And you know what? He, they're both sitting on the floor, and Michael comes in. You know what he says? There's a new sheriff in town, boys. <laughs> There's a new sheriff in town. Well, look at this verse right here. Verse 16, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New. What's new mean? Never been done before. We're not a revitalization of the nation Israel spiritually. Because that causes all kinds of problems in ages to come. They call it eschatology in theology, future times. All kinds of problems. You're lost. You just got, you twisted up your Bible. You'll never figure it out. You'll never figure it out. And that's why all these guys quote each other. Dr. So and so. You know, Dr. So and so and Dr. So and so and Dr. So and so. Well. If I was supposed to believe in the scholarship of man, I would. But God says to be a faithful steward, what I need to do? I need to be a steward of the mystery and the mysteries of God. The secrets within the secret of how God operates in us today. We're a new creature. See that passage? New creature. Colossians 1, we'll quit. Colossians 1. Colossians 1. Verse 23 in chapter 1. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, Colossians 1.23, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. That's the first thing you can't be ignorant of. Heavenly places. Which ye have heard, in which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Well, there's a statement I couldn't empirically produce. I couldn't prove that every creature in that generation had the gospel preached to them. 
And he says, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. It, it disseminated from me as the apostle of grace who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Why would he say that? He's actually suffering the afflictions of Christ in his body in the apostleship, in the office that got, that, that, that's magnified. Why would he say that? Because this is brand new information. It's information that is preached by the Lord Jesus Christ and Paul's suffering for it in his body. And then he says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Look at verse 26. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and generations but now is made manifest to his saints. Might we continue to manifest it 2,000 years later. Father, we're so thankful this morning for the intelligization of the spirit of our mind in order that we might serve thee, the privilege of that, and cause you to be made worthy in the sight of the sons of Adam, all of them. In the Lord Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Page...